The voice of Sherry. ASEAN Dailies, first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Good morning, this is Arlene, and you are listening to our ASEAN Daily podcast. We bring you news from Southeast Asia. First off, uh, from Brunei. Apparently, Brunei Sultan has removed his brother from cabinet. According to one news that Brunei Sultan Hassan Bolkiah announced a cabinet reshuffle in which he removed his brother as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade and himself took over the post in a move which appeared to centralize his own powers while reducing the presence of royalty in the cabinet. The Sultan, who is also the Prime Minister, Defence Minister and Finance Minister of the tiny oil-rich kingdom, announced the cabinet change on the national television. According to him, that uh, he, the Prince Muhammad Bolkia was not given any cabinet post and he will retire but will remain in Brunei's Privy Council. The Sultan's eldest son, Crown Prince Al Mutadi Billah, remains as senior minister. The Sultan also appointed two, deputy, two deputies to assist him, Hamdan Abdu Bakar and Muhammad Rosalan Dawood. With the removal of his brother, there is now no other direct member of the royal family in the new cabinet other than the Sultan and the Crown Prince. A political analyst based in Singapore said that changes show that the Sultan is trying to give a greater role in running the country to those who are not from the royal family, which will while, while still keep uh, a firm hand over the cabinet. In fact, in his speech uh, announcing the reshuffle, the Sultan reminded those who were appointed to the cabinet to be responsible and fair to the people. He said, we must remember the definition of a fairness should be guided by the right religion, legal and ethical principle. A Brunei last cabinet reshuffle was in fact a couple of years ago in 2010. From Brunei, we move on to Indonesia. Of course, the biggest problem that is affecting Indonesia right now and also the region is haze. In fact, haze has caused havoc with schools in neighboring countries in Singapore and Malaysia. It sh- uh, has shut down, flights grounded and events cancelled. Raging forest fires across Indonesia are thought to be responsible for up to half a million cases of respiratory infections, with the resultant ha- haze covering parts of Malaysia and Singapore now being described as a crime against humanity. Tens of thousands of hectares of forests have been aligned for more than two months as a result of slash and burn, the fastest and quickest way to clear land for new plantation. Indonesia is the world's largest producer of palm oil and fires are frequently intentionally lead to clear the land with the resulting haze as an annual headache. In fact, uh, endangered wildlife such as orangutan have also been forced to flee the forest because of the fires and uh, pollutant standard index or PSI have pushed towards 2,000 and more in areas in Sumatra and Kalimantan. In fact, anything above 300 sorry, is considered hazardous. And across the region, Indonesia's haze crisis has been causing a lot of havoc all over Southeast Asia, including areas in southern Philippines and also southern Thai. And haze-related illness have caused more than 500,000 cases of acute respiratory tract infections, uh, which has been reported since July 1st. Sutopo Purno 
Nugroho, the spokesperson of the Meteorology, Climatology and Geophysics Agency, has acknowledged that for months, 43 million people on the two islands have been inhaling toxic fumes. Yet, he admitted the number of unrecorded cases was likely much higher. This is a crime against humanity of extraordinary proportions, according to, to Sutopo. But now is not the time to point fingers, but to focus on how we can deal with the issue quickly. <coughs> Large parts of Indonesia has now been in a state of emergency for over a month. While has why has there not been a nationally declared total fire ban advertised twenty four seven on all television channels? which was asked by Dr. Eric Majard, an Indonesian-based associate professor at the University of Queensland, in a recent editorial in Jakarta Globe. He added, Why has there not been a clear message, you burn, you go to jail? That's supposed to be the message, according to him. By its own calculation, the fire have cost Indonesian government more than 30 billion US dollar, a huge blow for the country's floundering economy and the president's economic development agenda. Pressure to deal with the raging fires, haze and associated emissions is mounting as Indonesia prepares to discuss the climate commitments at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris this December or the COP21. Another issue that is pli- that is plugging Indonesia is regarding on the cancellation of a writers' festival, the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival, was cancelled on uh, because it featured a 1960s massacre as part of its um, festival events after pressure from Indonesia, which has put uh, the whole event to cancelled. An Australian foundation has expressed shock and disappointment over the cancellation of several events it was supporting at an international writers' festival in Bali. Five programs, including discussion panels, a book launch and a film screening, were scrapped off from the annual Ubud Readers and Writers' Festival, which will kick off on Wednesday on Bali. The Herb Faith Foundation, which promotes educational activities <coughs> about Indonesia, had helped organizing <coughs> organize the event designed to encourage discussion about communist purge, which according to Indonesia's National Human Rights Commission left more than 500,000 people dead 50 years ago. The academics Catherine McGregor and Gemma Purdy have cancelled their trip to Bali for the festival. The two have edited three books by Indonesians about the violence for the foundation. The English version of the book was going to be launched actually at the foundation. The whole purpose of the translation series was to make Indonesians' views known to the world, according to Dr. McGregor. Dr. McGregor, who has been studying Indonesia for the last 20 years, said that the response from authorities was 100% unexpected. The fact that their intention was to discuss books about this period uh, was a shocker to him. A screening of Joshua Opemir, raw insight into the man's a brave search for answers about his murdered brother. The look of silence has been cancelled too. The multi-award-winning documentary maker also created a film that gave a chilling insight into the minds of some of the perpetrators and the immunity that surrounds them. Amnesty International last month urged Indonesia to do more to provide justice for victims and their family that was part of the 1965 massacre. Another news from Indonesia is about Joko Widodo, as we all know that he just arrived in Washington. And U.S. President Obama just welcomed the Indonesian President Joko Widodo at the White House yesterday. And certain similarities uh, between the two leaders will be undeniable. Both are about the same age, around 54 years old, 
both were political outsiders before uh, meteor- their meteoric rise to power, which sparked hope and ex- expectations for change. The main focus of Jokowi's visit is to increase the bilateral cooperation between Indonesia and America. This is according to him uh, when he mentioned it in Jakarta before leaving to the U.S., mainly in investment and trade and also in digital economy and creative economy. But on the upbeat note side, a plethora of problems back home are overshadowing his trips. Here are the four challenges that Jokowi will be facing. Uh, number one, of course, is the environment uh, issues that uh, Jokowi definitely will face a lot of uh, questions from the US, especially the haze and forest fire that are raging in Sumatra and Kalimantan. Another thing is about human rights, uh, especially on Jokowi's hardline stance on the death penalty for drug convicts and his silence on the ongoing intolerance towards the country's religious minorities. Jokowi is also reluctant to address the country's past human rights abuses, including the 1965 mass killings. And... On the other hand, the economic issue that is also uh, plug- plugging Indonesia as the global economic slowdown has weakened economic growth in Southeast Asia's biggest economy. Indonesia rupiah value had in fall sharply against the dollar, making it the worst performing currency in Asia. Jokowi's cabinet reshuffling in a mid-August won prices. Uh, including Harvard-educated private equity executive Thomas Lembong as having it him as trade minister. And although Jokowi has repeatedly assured overseas business and political leaders that Indonesia welcomes foreign investment, his economic policies tend to lean towards protectionism from laws governing mining and technology, a rise of import duties on a range of consumer goods to more restrictions on hiring foreign professionals and also the possibility for Indonesia to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership is uh, spearheaded by the US, a long-time business and trade partner of Indonesia. That is possible that Jokowi wants to clear this mixed signal during his US visit. Another issue that is of course on the table for Jokowi is his foreign policy. He has won support from international celebrities such as Sting, Guns N' Roses, guitarist and Jason Mraz. But in his foreign policy, that p- the president tends to look inward rather than outward. Jokowi's foreign policy is driven primarily by domestic concern and less by international status. Unlike his predecessor, which is uh, Bambang Yuhoyono. For example, the South China Sea issue uh, is not really high on the plate for Indonesia. While Jakarta is wary of Beijing encroachment in Indonesia and enemistate Natuna area of Borneo, it is also wishing closer investment ties with China. In fact, China won the high-speed rail project between Jakarta and Bandung following a murky bidding process, which angered Japan. Anyway, we'll take a short break. When we return, we'll discuss further on the economic side of Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies First and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. You're back with me again on Durian ASEAN. So, when it comes to the Philippines, although it is being touted as the second strongest economy in Asia, it is in fact near the bottom when it comes to quality infrastructure among the 10 members of ASEAN. This was revealed during the third ASEAN Connectivity Forum held here in Seoul last week, where uh, at, where it was attended by Ambassador Raul Hernandez and other ASEAN officials. The Korean government sponsored the event. 
In a press kit provided to ASEAN journalists, Manila ranked eighth uh, ahead of Vietnam and Myanmar compared with other ASEAN member states in terms of overall quality of infrastructure. Singapore topped the list, followed by Malaysia, Brunei, Thailand, Laos, Indonesia and Cambodia. The source of information, according to the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, or short for AREA, was the World Economic Forum report in 2013-2014. Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Brunei, on the other hand, had uncertainty and unspecific laws when government infrastructure projects are bidded out. The ASEAN Connectivity Forum came about as the 10-member nation with the help of Korea wanted to introduce infrastructure projects and policy directions in the field of transport, energy and information, as well as communications technology. A press release for the event disclosed the amount of investment required for ASEAN infrastructure project is the second largest in the world next to the Middle East. And it is a concept that envisions a well-connected ASEAN to bring the people, goods, services and capital together, which was adopted on the 17th ASEAN Summit in 2010. I'm talking about the ASEAN economy community, which consists of 6.4 billion people and a combined total GDP of 2.4 trillion. Moving on to another news uh, when it comes to Russia. It is the Asian Sea Arch. And Russia's Asian pivot, geo economic shift towards the Southeast Asia. Russia is in the midst of transformational geo economic pivot, whereby its previous Western prioritized economic relations are rapidly moving forward towards Asia. While much attention has been given to the Russian Chinese strategic partnership, particularly less have been made of Russia's attempts to diversify its. Asian relations and break into the ASEAN marketplace. What's critically being left out of the discourse are the political economic advances that Russia has already made in this direction. How the utilization of a shrewd and guided economic policy can reap lasting rewards of in actualizing Russia's full Asian Sea Arc potential. In terms of strategy, it is much more likely that Russia can make a strong economic impact in newly emerging markets where there's less of an institutionalized and established competitive presence like in Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia whose economy are still much smaller than the regional powerhouses Indonesia and Malaysia. Vietnam already has a free trade deal with Russia and Thailand is rapidly moving towards that direction too. The focus is thus passes to Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia. On the other hand, about Malaysia. Malaysia will be recruiting migrant workers online. Malaysia intends to carry out the recruitment process of migrant workers via the internet as a way to reduce costs. Opening the 8th Asia ASEAN Forum on Migrant Labour in Kuala Lumpur, Minister Richard Riot James said that this method could also prevent workers from having to face the issue of debt bondage. Labour Department Director General Mohammad Jeffrey Jokim read out his speech text that employers and workers shall comply with the strict liability principles such as providing accommodations with basic amenities, minimum wage, medical examination and compliance of international labour standards. He also highlighted the drop in industry accident rate in the country. He mentioned that it is a rate that clearly proves the seriousness of the government in addressing the issue at stake. Therefore, migrant workers should be feeling safe working in Malaysia as Malaysian treats local and migrant workers under the Occupational Safety and Health Act 1994 equally in terms of rights without any discrimination. This is according to the minister himself. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll talk about the arts and culture side of Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies, first and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, you are back again with me, Arlene, on the Durian ASEAN 
So, on the arts and culture, Heritage Trust unveils 21st century blueprint for Rangoon. Following a four-year study of Yangon's uh, urban landscape, the Yangon Heritage Trust has unveiled its vision to revitalize the former capital. Released uh, last week on Wednesday and open to public consultation on the organization's website, the Yangon is seen as great 21st century city blueprint advocates preserving large tracts of Rangoon's urban heritage as the city develops. The plan outlines a suggestion conservation zones in most of the eight townships making up downtown grid, encouraging new developments around the existing circular railway line in the east and west of the city and maintaining low-density neighbourhoods in the township between Sule Pagoda and Inle Lake. Shea Yin Mar Or, the YHT communications and media manager, told the Irawadi that public input on the proposal will be referred to decision makers and development stakeholders for consideration as the blueprint evolves. Their vision is to have a good urban planning system that will cover the whole of Yangon. They think that the next Yangon uh, government and regional parliament should make this a priority. The plan also recommends establishing a green belt around Shedagon Pagoda and maintaining existing sightline to the historic edifice. On the other hand, Singapore to get its own cherry blossoms. Seasonal flowering trees to be planted at the future Jurong Lake Gardens. Uh, Singapore soon will have the sakura blossom in its backyard as trees with pink, white and purple flowers are set to dot parts of the upcoming Jurong Lake Gardens. The west side of the gardens will be lined with seasonal flowering trees such as the Malayan crab. Maltel, the rosy trumpet trees and the pink mampat. National Development Minister Lawrence Wong yesterday likened these tropical plants to Japan's famous sakura or cherry blossoms trees. Soon, they will have their own cherry blossom festival. This is what uh, was wrote in the Facebook post of the Minister Lawrence Wong. There will be a deliberate effort to plant more flowering trees at the Jurong Lake Garden. He noted that the National Park Board has received many suggestions to plant such trees. These trees usually flower in February, March, August and September. The planting was part of the Clean and Green SG-15 mass tree planting project which aims to plant more than 5,000 trees from August to December in celebration of Singapore's Golden Jubilee. That's all from us today. Thanks for listening to Duran Asen. You can always catch us on our social media, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. For the latest updates, you can also listen to our podcast at our YouTube channels as well as you can listen to us on the go via your mobile by downloading the Durian ASEAN app. Bye!